Hi everybody, David here from Via Render. In this video, I'm going to go through the creation of this entire scene. I'll take you through the SketchUp build, get you into D5, and discuss the materials, the lighting, and the decorative elements. I'll talk about my render settings and run through the post-production in Photoshop. This video is intended as sort of one long tutorial, but you can feel free to skip ahead to the sections that might interest you. And this was recorded in sort of one big session, so some of it is going to be a little bit like a monologue. It's just sort of stream of consciousness. As I go, I'll be just showing you what I'm doing and explaining why. This is intended to give you a basic introduction to D5 version 2.4. We'll talk about some of the changes and features that we'll come across as we use it. All right, let's go ahead and get into it. All right, good morning, everybody. So before we get going, let's go ahead and just take a quick look at our SketchUp scene. All right, so here we have SketchUp. And um, you can see it's a pretty basic build. I've got my model moved above the ground plane. This is so we don't deal with the issues of a horizon line. Over here, we've got just a simple background that was downloaded from the warehouse. Now there's a very good chance that we will be replacing these with the new backgrounds in D5 render version 2.4, but I haven't had a chance to look at those yet. So for now, this is going to work. All right, if we look at our basic build as well, I'm going to hide and hide these walls and hide these walls just to make navigation a little bit easier. All right, so this is our overall build. Please note that everything in the scene comes from the warehouse. There's nothing sort of that I've brought in from a separate asset or model pack. These are all just objects straight from the warehouse. So Props to the creators of a lot of these. They're really, really good stuff. All right, so the primary build, the primary focus, I should say, is going to be on this bedroom section right here. So our camera is gonna be positioned a little bit like this. Now, if we like the end results, we might do a little bit more. Maybe we'll do some alternative shots, maybe from the side or something a little bit like that. But the primary focus is going to be this shot right here. And you can see I'm just gonna keep hiding walls as they get in the way. And, oops. Let's hide. There we go. All right. So that's what we're looking at. I think it's a pretty nice modern build inspired by some artwork that I saw online that looks at New York style lofts and using sort of a modern industrial look. Okay. We also have uh, two other rooms at the back here. So let me go ahead and just hide these. And you can see we've got an area right here for our bathroom, which I haven't really decorated. We've got a little bit of decoration on the side here, and then we've just got a storage closet area right here. So all in all, relatively functional space with a kitchen area that, again, has got a lot of built-in equipment. Uh, I'm trying to minimize space and try and just use it as, as well as I possibly can. And then we can see we've also got some decorative elements here. Okay, with that being said, let's go ahead and unhide everything. So I'm going to go up to view, hidden geometry, view hidden objects, and I'm going to do control A to select everything, right click and unhide. All right, now we are using D5 render version 2.4, so I guess the brand newish one. I have not had a chance to Kind of experiment with this at all very much and um if you've been following the release you've probably seen there's you know some people seem to be having an amazing experience with it and others seem to be having kind of problematic experiences so fingers crossed that everything will be nice and stable all right let's go ahead and send it over to d5 All right, everybody, here we are in D5 version 2.4. And yeah, you can kind of see everything came in just fine. Please note that I didn't update the D5 converter. The only thing I did was to make sure that D5 version 2.4 was turned on. So I have both 2.3 and 2.4 on the same computer. And I strongly recommend you maybe think about doing that if you have the hard drive space. 
and you are kind of worried that maybe you'll run into issues in the newer version, just go ahead and install it in its own separate location and you should be able to run them just fine. You'll just have to log in, I believe, each time separately, but that's that's relatively easy. Now, here we go. Here's our scene. Thankfully, the interface um, has remained pretty much unchanged. I think it's a slightly darker gray. I could be wrong on that. I've also seen on the form there is reference that D5 version 2.4 now runs on the Unreal Engine 5 as opposed to a highly, highly modified version of the Unreal Engine 4, which is really, really cool going forward. Now, um, you can see up here the stats. The only thing I'm noticing from my perspective is what looks like a little bit more uh, RAM usage. Normally this would be around like 30 something percent. Um, seeing it at 44, it's not crazy increase and doesn't raise any red flags, but it, it's kind of curious. Please note this also has about half a million faces or how D5 interprets faces, which I'm still not entirely sure of whether they use uh, vertexes, um, polygons or edges or exactly just how they interpret geometry. But here we go. All right. Looking at it from the inside, you can see just by moving the camera in here, yeah, um, it's definitely a little bit brighter just by default. Please note, I have not changed any of these settings over here. Auto exposure, the, the normal settings are set to on. You can see that over here. We can turn that off and it, you can see as per usual, it bounces back to this much darker mode. So I'm going to leave auto just on and we'll manually adjust that in a moment. All right. Yeah, you're, there's just a lot more ambient light and this seems to be consistent with what a lot of the preview users were saying on you know on the different groups and on the forums it's just more light in the scene and this is something we'll have to get used to okay with that being said um if you're not familiar with the d5 interface i'll go through things relatively slowly just so you know what's going on over here we have a couple of options we have menus for file, view, edit, things like that. This is where all your options are going to be for preferences and saving, things like that. The asset library tab is gonna be up here and you can click on that and that will bring up options for different models, materials, and particle effects. All right, I'm gonna, we will use that extensively, so don't worry about that for now. Over here, we also have the option to create a new scene. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the create new scene button to actually set up my camera. Now you'll notice things are a little bouncy as I move up and down. I'm gonna go to the top right corner. I'm gonna go up here to navigation. By default, navigation in D5 is set to orbit where the right mouse button orbits around. This is not my preference. So I'm gonna go ahead and change that to fly. And fly will be very familiar to any of you who've either played a first person shooter video game or have used Twin Motion or Lumion or even SketchUp, I think. Um, so it's basically the WASD keys. All right, I'm gonna drop the speed down. So as we do that, you'll notice that uh, moving around the scene becomes a little bit smoother and a little bit nicer. All right, it also allows me to set up a nice precise camera. So this angle looks pretty good. I'm getting the chair, I'm getting some of the window. I'm gonna go ahead and hit create new scene. And there we go. I'm also gonna move over here to maybe add one or two additional camera angles for our shot. And I'm going to do another, uh, let's hit this little button right here, add scene. All right, now I've got two scenes and I'm going to go into the kitchen and do one more. And um, you may be wondering why we why bother doing this. It's just really nice to be able to sort of establish your camera angles before you get too deep into things and just have an idea sort of of how you want things to look. It's nice to just set up your cameras preemptively. There we go. I've got four pretty nice camera angles set up. I can bounce between any of these and you can see right now the settings are actually uh, sort of a smooth transition. We can go ahead and change that. I'm going to turn off transition animation and now I'm just going to snap and you can keep either one on. It doesn't really matter. I just like the snapping is a little bit more immediate. Now, one other thing to note is the display option up here. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about these as we go through this, but right now um, there seems to be basically precise and smooth. Precise being not quite the real time because 
you can see this little icon up here, the little running man. If you turn that on, you're getting the real time settings. I'm going to leave it actually off because I don't like working with it on. But um, what's interesting is we've sort of we've gone from three preview qualities in the previous versions of DeFi we used to have the high, medium and low. Now, medium, I always found to be really unusable. It just was really noisy. And so you would use high or if you wanted to bounce around rapidly, put it to low. Now, that was my own personal experience and mileage may vary. Here we have really effectively high has been replaced by precise and smooth is really, really low. Now, I guarantee you, you will, we'll probably end up switching to this quite a little bit, especially when we start assigning materials and lights. But if you want to see preview quality now, I believe it's been put to F12. And so you can go ahead and hit that and see what you get. But I'm just going to leave it on just precise until we start noticing maybe really high RAM usage or that the frames per second gets really bad. But that won't really happen until we start adding an awful lot of materials and start adding a lot of lighting effects as well. All right, let's move on. Let's start assigning materials. All right, to assign materials, I'm going to hit M on the keyboard and bring up my asset uh, sort of library here. So this is the um, asset library for D5. It is not hosted locally. So for example, if I want to go and download something, let me see here, I'm going to go, I'll get out of the nature tab and let's just go to accessories. And if I want to actually bring something into my scene, please note that these are actually kept on a server. So it's, you know, it's not absolutely essential, but I do strongly recommend the best internet that you can kind of get for this. I'm going to go and download this pen and notebook eraser. And when I do that, you can see I can bring it right into my scene and I can go and place this wherever I want. Now, um, I tried D5 render when it came out initially at work and I noticed that some objects downloaded really fast and some downloaded really, really slowly. So I'm not sure if there's kind of a backend thing or if it's just bandwidth on the servers. There's also some people seem to be having issues with thumbnails just not generating. Uh, that seems to be kind of resolved right now. I'm not noticing any issues where, you know, if we go into any of these tabs, are we running into any major, major problems? It doesn't seem to be. It seems to be quite responsive. Uh, and I'm not running like the most insanely fast internet or anything like that. I think it's at best 200 megabytes. So hopefully whatever backend little quirks were happening have been resolved. All of this seems to be quite responsive. Now, okay, if you're not familiar, the model library tab is effectively one of D5's really biggest strengths. You can see here, um, there are 9,000 models. I think they recently just added like another 900 models, which is an absolutely staggering amount of content to add. And the, the thing about it is, it's not just that there's a lot of assets, it's that they're really, really good quality. Other rendering programs that I've talked about on the channel have got lots of assets too. And some of them are kind of meh or outdated or just don't look good anymore or really also just not up to the standard. The D5 assets are really high quality and we'll see that when we start decorating. Okay, in this section though, we want to talk about materials more specifically. And again, you can see we've got a very large array of materials. So as I work through this, I'm only going to concentrate on the ones that I think might be noteworthy or interesting to you. And I'll save you from having to watch me sign pretty much every material. All right. The first one that I'm going to look at, though, is glass. And you can see here, I have a number that are already favorited. So I've got mirrors, black metal, and this one right here, which is normal glass. So I'm going to go and click on this. You can see it's going to download. Left click and assign it with the eyedropper tool. Okay, that looks pretty nice. You can see it's done a really nice job. And because D5 is a ray traced real-time engine, you are getting a really nice impression of the overall highlights. That's the window light hitting this glass, which looks really, really, really cool. Okay, the next one I'm going to use is this mirror brass. And again, select it, click on it, and assign. All right, these materials are already looking really, really nice. 
I'm going to hit I on the keyboard and I'm going to just sample this white material right here. And when I do that, you can see we've got the, the mapping. This is effectively the material parameters. All right. So if we look over here on the right, we've got the base color. And again, I've selected this plastic right here. I can go in and I can manually tweak the base color. And so I could make this maybe a little bit, just a little bit gray, not quite completely white or black, just a little bit gray. I have no maps actually loaded up. If I wanted to, I could load up my normal specular roughness metallic and my ambient occlusion maps. But if I just leave that separately, by default, D5 will create a normal map if the base color has any sort of color information. Now, mine doesn't, so it's just going to sit like that. But that should be enough to kind of give the impression of plastic. If I take up the specularity, it'll become obviously more shiny. And if I take up the roughness, I'm telling D5 that this object, the surface of this object, is rough. It's still reflective because everything, every material is reflective to some degree. It's just that this one is going to be less reflective. Okay, I think that looks pretty good. Let's move on in the next section. We're gonna grab a concrete material and we're going to assign a wood material. And I'm going to go back to wall and roof. Now, what you're looking for specifically is this one here, wall paint. And you can see here, if we scroll down, this is where we're getting some of the concrete materials. Now, I'm going to look for one that I think looks pretty good, maybe something that's kind of a little rough. And so let's go ahead and select this, click on that, and go ahead and assign it. Okay, yeah, that looks really, really lovely. Now, if I use my eyedropper tool and click on this, so that's I on the keyboard. Now you can see we've got a material that has maps assigned. And I'm gonna run this entire project here just using D5 materials. I'm not gonna bring in anything from like any other website or the mega scans library, just using D5 materials. You can see here, we have the base color, which again, we could tweak if we wanted for some bizarre reason to have red concrete, but I'm gonna leave it at its default. We've also got the normal map that you can adjust and you can go ahead and just affect by really just moving this slider here, you're going to affect whether the normal map sort of goes sort of inwards or out. And I'm gonna go ahead and just leave it at its negative. And we've got the specular map. You can see that because the wall is concrete, it is not reflective. The specular map is effectively black to say this is not a shiny surface and the roughness slider is also taken up. So in other words, this is not going to be a slick, shiny surface. It's not going to, effectively, light is going to hit it and it's not gonna pick up any specular highlights. It's, it's basically just going to be exactly what it looks like. Uh, I know that's sort of a gross simplification, but there you go. All right. Um, I think that looks pretty good. I may end up changing this if I find that the sort of jaggediness of the normal map maybe is just a little bit too much. If I find that uh, it's just a little bit too strong maybe, we can always just replace this by grabbing another rough concrete. All in all, um, I'm pretty happy though. I think this, oh yeah, let's, let's use this guy. This guy looks pretty nice. Now, one other thing I want to talk about uh, briefly here is just sampling materials. I'm going to hit I on the keyboard and again, use my eyedropper and then click O. And you can see now I can take that material and assign it up here. So again, I will sample and O will allow you to assign it to a new object. That looks pretty nice. The next material I want to work on is the wood floors. So I'm going to hit M on the keyboard. And for these, you'll notice um, that's interesting. We've got two separate areas for wood. So floor is one. And you can see we've got wood floor under its own specific thing. First time I used D5, I struggled to find these sort of wood laminates. These are effectively modern wooden flooring. And if you go to the wood section here, really what you're getting here is wood grains. So these we'll end up using, for example, on this right here on the bedside table but for flooring itself we need to go to floor and wood floor you can see d5 has got a really fantastic array of different wood floor materials and some of these you'll use quite a lot if you find yourself using a wood floor material that you really really like you can always click the little heart icon here which will actually add it to your favorites now i'm going to go ahead and just select this download it and assign it now, 
wood flooring is probably one of those things that you will spend a lot of time on if you do visualization it's probably one of the most common maybe next to maybe next to stained concrete recently but wood flooring is just one of the things that you're just going to spend a lot of time on and finding the exact right wood flooring for your scene is just just part of it really and so it's really quick and nice to just select these, try out different materials, see what looks good. I think that looks good. Tony antiseptic wood. I'm going to try hardening this one. And I think that looks good. I think I'll keep this. So what I'm going to do is just change the scale. So I'm going to use the eyedropper, sample, go over here to the right. I'm going to ignore all the map settings and go down to the section right here. So we can minimize the maps. All right. Here we have options. If this was not displaying correctly or was displaying in a sort of janky manner, we can try hitting the triplanar option. I wouldn't use this on a flat surface, generally speaking, but if you were using this on something where the projection just wasn't working or the sort of standard UV projection, which is just a flat planar map, wasn't working, you can go ahead and try turning triplanar on. And I've had great success with this, actually doing a really good job figuring out the mapping. So we may end up using that on something like this here, which is going to be the sliding door because it's in a regular shape. But for now, we'll turn it off. And what I am going to adjust is the scale and the stretch on this just a little bit. So for that, I'm going to go and adjust the stretch here. And I'm just going to left click and drag to get these tiles, I'm sorry, to get these wood boards up to really just kind of what I think they should be in terms of size. And I actually want the wood flooring in this room to be quite chunky. I don't want it to be very elegant. I can also just select that, type in 0 0.2 and hit enter. And I think that looks probably a little bit too big. 0 0.25 will work. There's no magic uh, stretch setting for every material. Anytime I adjust this, I think you're going to have to just type it in by hand and just kind of try and see what works and what looks really good. One other thing on the materials, I'm going to select our concrete material again. So just close that out, hit I, select the concrete using the eyedropper, and you'll notice this really sharp edge here. This is because of how this was built in SketchUp. There's no beveling and there's no edge. Now, if you look at the, you know, the table, for example, that your monitor is actually sitting on, or if you're on a laptop, the surface that your laptop is on, you'll notice if you look at the edge of it, there's a tiny bevel. Now, D5 considers this round corners. If you're using Lumion, it's called edges. It doesn't really matter the vernacular. What matters is that nothing in real life has a mathematically sharp edge like that. That is just too sharp. And so we get around that by using either a bevel or in D5 going to turn on the round corner option and you can see, I'm going to zoom really far in here. Off, on, off, and on. It's subtle, but it is there. And you really want to do this on pretty much every material. Every material, um, especially the larger ones. You don't maybe have to do it with some of these ones, like this metal here. I don't know if I'd necessarily do it there. But anything like this, you really want to turn on that round corners and you just want to make sure that it stays on. And that will, once that's toggled on for material, it will be assigned to that material and it will stay on. Um, yeah, this is just one of those things that you just, you have to do. Basically, it's going to make everything look better. If you find that the radius is a little too sharp, we can always go in here and just type in one. This is, after all, still a concrete wall. It wouldn't be perfectly smooth, but it would still have some semblance of an edge. Okay, I'm going to move on material-wise and maybe take a look at the fabric materials for the couch and I'll start assigning materials. I'll also talk a little bit about this rug material and see if there's anything we can do to make that look a little bit better. But all in all, this is looking pretty nice. And then we'll move in to the decorating phase. All right, I'll see you in the next section. I am going to again use the eyedropper tool and sample this material here. Not really in love with the material that came in from SketchUp. So let's go ahead and hit M here. 
we'll go up to fabric. And I haven't pre-figured out what I'm going to put on this, so I'm probably just going to find something that I kind of like the look of and assign that. Let's take a look at the burgundy linen cloth. And I'm going to drag this out onto this and just take a quick look and see. Okay, you can see the scale is very, very off. So let's look at the stretch slider. And I'm going to actually crank this. Let's take this all the way to 10. Okay, looks okay. The color is obviously off, but in terms of really the scale, I think it, we could adjust it a little bit more. Let's take that up to 14. Yeah, that looks about right. And then I'm going to adjust the color of this by changing the base color slider. And you can adjust the color manually. You can switch to RGB, HSV, or hex code if you have the hex. I do like using the hex, so I'm going to use that. I'm going to drag this slider here and then go in and tweak this. Okay, let's see how this looks. And pulling my camera back. All right, I think that looks pretty good. I am also going to try turning on triplanar and see how that looks. Now you can see the light is kind of moving around curiously. I'm not in love with the triplanar projection, so let's just turn it straight off. Yeah, I think we'll leave it on its default. I am going to change the brass buttons on the chair. And what I'm going to do is again, sample from the brass material here, hit O on the keyboard and a sign. All right, that looks pretty nice. I'm not loving the chair legs, so let's go ahead and get a metal. Hit M on the keyboard, and I favorited uh, one of the metal materials that I use a lot, which is literally this one here. I love this material, black metal. It's just so useful in so many situations. So I'm gonna select that and assign it to the chair legs, and I'm gonna assign it to the legs of the table here as well. Okay. That looks pretty nice to me. Again, you know, going forward, would I probably have just decorated this with chairs from D5? Yeah, probably. I, I think so. This was originally intended as a Lumion project, and so I brought in a lot of assets. Now, this wood material here, let's go to wood, and we're going to go down to here to grain. And I'm going to look for something comparable. I could just keep this wood material and adjust these settings, but let's look for something a little comparable. Let's try this ash and see how this works. Okay, ash is nice. It's coming in a little too bright for my liking, especially compared to what we had. So let's try, I'm gonna ignore the ashes. Let's try the generic light color wood material and see if that works. Yeah, and you can see how quickly these download, which is pretty impressive. All right, that looks kind of nice. Yeah, I like the look of that. Let's turn on triplanar and see how it does with the projection. Okay, there we go. Pulling the camera back, I think that looks really, really nice. I am going to also make sure that we put the round corner on, and I'm going to put the radius quite low on this one. Same with the metal. I think we'll put a slightly, I believe one is about as low as you can go, but I think that looks pretty sweet. And I might adjust the scale. See, can I get a little bit more of that nice grain in there? Yeah. Okay, looks pretty good. Pretty happy with the overall look and feel of that. All right. With that being said, I'm going to go and continue to add materials around the scene. I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on every single material. Um, you'll, you'll find that as you just get into D5, you'll definitely use certain materials again. So just go ahead and give those a little heart. And those will be the ones that you'll bounce back to a lot. The last material I'm going to talk about is the wall material. So I'm in the kitchen now. I'm going to hit M on the keyboard and I'm going to go back to my favorites tab. Now, I've gone ahead and favorited, there's a white wall paint material. I believe historically this was under the wall and roof. You've got to scroll down a little bit. It's, in my mind, the epitome of just a perfect wall material. It doesn't have a really strong normal map or a lot of relief. And when you assign it, it comes in just looking like that. It's just the perfect generic wall 
surface. And so what I'm going to do then is go to the base color and drop this down. Please note that black walls in interiors are not like this. Black paint is not, uh, unless you're doing something really weird, black paint is not completely black. It's best thought of as extremely, extremely dark gray. And so I'm going to take that back up just a little bit. But I, I would avoid the temptation to just be like, oh, this is a black wall and just throw the darkest black on there. That's just not accurate. So just be mindful of that. Really think of it as extremely, extremely dark grays. All right, that looks really, really nice. I think that's good. All right, I'm going to continue uh, tweaking the materials here, which is going to it's going to take a bit of time. There's no way around that. It's just a time consuming process. And the longer you use D5, hopefully the faster you'll get with it, just like any other program. But I'm going to spare you guys all from having to watch that. And in the next section, we're going to get into assets. All right, welcome back everyone. Now, I've gone ahead and assigned pretty much all the materials that I want to work on in this scene. And, um, you know, if you have any questions about any material use, uh, just shoot me a message or whatever, but they're pretty basic. I've just added some decorative stuff and, uh, you know, just kind of cleaned up all the materials. Almost everything now features a D5 material. There are some areas where there, I haven't looked at them yet, including the curtains, and I got to figure out what we're going to do on that, but we'll get to that later. Almost everything that was decorative has also been given a D5 material. Just like that. All right. So I want to move on and talk about decorations with you. And so what we're going to do is hit M on the keyboard. And instead of materials, we're finally going to move on and go to the model library tab. Now, obviously, we don't have time to go through literally everything in this, so I'm not going to bother. Um, nature tab, we probably won't be touching on this for this project for an interior shot. If this was in sort of a more commercial render, absolutely, you're going to get very familiar with these. I will point out there are a couple of things that I absolutely do love. The flowering trees, particularly some of these ones like this, are really good. D5 also tends to label these with their correct scientific name. So, for example, begonia or asus. Um, and so you're going to get quite familiar with those. I usually, if I'm curious, will just pull up a Chrome tab and just do a quick Google search to figure out exactly what the tree name equates to in colloquial speech. So for example, acers tend to be like your maples, things like that. So for example, this one right here is a blazing red maple is what it would generally be known as. I think it's a really, really clever way to do this. And you can see we have lots of different options here. And again, unlike a lot of the models from other programs, the models in D5 are fantastic. Uh, there's no other way to put it. They're just really, really good. They're high quality. Now we're going to move on from the nature tab, but I really, really recommend that you work your way through here and go ahead and favorite them. You can see under my favorites tab, have quite a lot of generic broadleafs and including some of which that are actually considered low poly trees down here you can see these ones are very useful for just kind of plotting out a scene if you want to block the horizon line or really just want to add some context now i'm going to close out the nature tab our primary focus right now is going to be on a couple of things we're not adding any furniture, but again, you can see there's an enormous array of furniture and it is, I promise you, top notch work. It really is fantastically good stuff. The other thing to note is furniture and material, basically the material properties of the furniture, you can actually change them. So for example, if I place this in my scene, this little brown fabric, let me go ahead and place this. And, and this is something I think a lot of D5 users may not even be aware of. You can sample a different material, hit O, and go ahead and assign it to this. So, for example, I'm going to sample this one here, hit O, and go in and change it like that. Now, this doesn't seem like that big a deal, but I'm sure a lot of you will have come across the perfect model in another asset library and just found that the materials and the textures are all wrong. So the great thing about this is you can look at this, something like this or this chair and be like, I really love this, but it's the wrong color or the wrong material. Maybe it should be leather. Well, that's fine. Just bring it into your scene and you can change it. 
Now, um, moving on from that, what we're going to look for is the accessories. And this is going to be the stuff. This is effectively thought of as the, the interior design component or the set dressing of your scene. So I'm gonna look specifically at the ornaments and some of the potted greenery sections. So under the ornaments tab, you're going to have a wide variety of really good decorative elements. You can see, we can scroll down. We've got absolutely a ton, a ton of stuff here. And a lot of this is part of the newer objects that have been added. Now, what I would recommend you do here is to take some time, scroll through, look for the pieces that really catch your eye because you're gonna end up using them again and again and again. That's been my workflow and I found it to be quite useful. That's not to say you can't do what I refer to as going shopping. You can, and this is something I'll, I tell my students all the time, when you're interior designing and interior decorating your shot, do think of it as just going shopping. Just pull up these tabs, favorite the ones you want for at least that project you don't have to place them just yet, but go ahead and grab them. Effectively, go ahead and click on the little heart icon here and add them to your favorites. You can always undo that just by unfavoriting them, but think of this as literally going shopping. You can also play the game of who. And what I mean by that is figure out the story for your scene. It's not enough to just say, oh, this is an interior render. Okay, cool, that's that's great. That doesn't really tell me a huge amount. Figure out the who and the why. Who lives here? Why are they here? What are they interested in? Um, you know, what is their background? So you just figure out what they like. They obviously, in this case, you know, are into Star Wars. Let's see if there's something else we can add in that adds to that. Sure, they've got some decorative elements, but is there something maybe more whimsical, more playful that you can add to the scene? Maybe some really cool decorative artwork, or maybe some just some toys, because why not? And just think about the who and the why. And I think that will help quite a bit. Now, I'm not gonna go through every model here. What I will do is do exactly what I said you should do, which is go shopping. I'm gonna bookmark a whole bunch of objects and assets that I, I think will add to the scene. And I've got ample space right here in the kitchen. And I've got a little bit of dead space maybe in the corners that I think I should populate with stuff. It's also nice to add a few things because if you're like me, your bedside table, you usually end up accruing stuff there. Like maybe it's your phone or a phone charger or some books or something. And I think it'll add just a little bit. One of my favorite things to do is also put draped objects, particularly clothes over furniture, just because I find that's something I think happens in real life a lot. People will throw down clothes onto furnishings uh, or maybe that's just me being messy. But either way, it adds a little bit of life and gives that looked in feel to your shot. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and do exactly what I said. Let's start set decorating or set building or just adding this content to our scene. And I'll see you in the next section. So, okay, let's bounce over here really quickly. You can see we've added some books and these are readily available. This is just book set um, that you can get from the asset library. Same with these books here. We've added some book holders on either end, just some bookends, and added this really nice little, what I think is really cool little model that I haven't seen before, which is just a brass head, basic modern look. Very cool. We've also added a few elements of greenery and On top of that, we've added some personal touches like the ceramic sort of metal modern looking coffee maker or coffee press. And we've added some greenery, especially in the corners here. Anytime you find you've got this edged corner, it's good to offset it a little bit. You'll also notice that we've put a lot of these decorative elements on their own layer. So layers are over here on the left. You can use the plus sign to add a layer and they'll come in named layer one, two, three, four, and so forth. You can right click and you can hide them and you can also delete them as well. Now, I generally will go in and double click and 
name the layer. So deco or decoration will be on whatever layer that features a lot of my decorative elements. So I'll usually just name it that. And I use pretty much the same colors, uh, name, sorry, the same naming convention for pretty much every project I use. So deco is going to be decoration. And you can see if I toggle that off, some of the objects like that was this, for example, will disappear from your scene. So they're still there. You can go ahead and turn them on or off. Generally speaking, if you've got a lot of decorative stuff, and I find the decorative elements that are really nice will sometimes feature multiple materials like this glass, and maybe it's gotten these leaves. It, it, it is faster, I think, to work with these off. There's no need to have these being displayed. Once you know they're there and you know they look good, feel free to just hide them. With that being done, we've got a bit of character and a bit of life in our scene. All right, everyone, as we move into the next section, it's time to look at the environment. Just a reminder, we do have our scenes set up over here on the left. So we have our camera angles that we're probably going to use. Now we haven't gone in and actually looked at really the focal length or anything like that. So that's something we can get to later on. All right. I'm gonna go over here to the right. By default, we're using the geo and sky. So the geo and sky is pretty simple. Let's go outside and I'm actually gonna place a tree. And a reminder, this is not a be all and end all. This is just a really brief explanation if you're not familiar with D5. But the Geo and Sky was sort of the, the original lighting setup within D5 going back to the early versions. So you can see if we go ahead and just place our little tree here and we go to the environment tab, the Geo and Sky is the default lighting. I'm going to spin this and you can see all it's doing is moving a sort of pseudo sun around and you can place it at specific times. You could put it at a specific time hour or minute. And as you can see, as we move that, it's going to affect really the light source, which is this, you know, let me see if I can move out here a little bit, is going to be the sun in the sky. Very simple lighting setup, just a directional sun that casts shadows. We also have the options for going in for the north offset. And this would allow us to effectively pick a time of day and direction, a longitude and latitude. And then inside here, we can also open up the sun disk radius, which will affect whether the shadows are sharper or whether they are in fact a lot softer. We can tweak that as much as you want. A little hard to see on this tree right now because the tree is without context. However, if we look over here on the right, we have the HDRI setup. Now, for a very long time, I was convinced that the Geo and Sky gave a better result. That was my personal take on this. I have come around to the use of the HDRIs, and I think it's sort of to do with just really the softness of their lighting. It's not as sharp, I think, in my mind, as the Geo and Sky. Now, in saying that, if you do want to add more light to your Geo and Sky, you do the ability to turn on the sun here. And again, this sun, these settings very much mimic the Geo and Sky settings, sunlight intensity and the radius of the sun. But you also get added some kind of little, the overall ambient lighting that comes with the HDRI. So cumulatively, if you put these together, you can get a really nice result. Now, I want to light the scene not quite not quite pitch black outside, so it's not like nighttime, but I don't want it to be particularly bright out there. So let's go ahead and select our little floating tree, delete that, we don't need that, and go back to scene one. I'm going to ensure that I turn on the HDRI early morning. Let's, um, maybe let's grab the sunset, all right. You can also load up your own customizable HDRIs. Now that's a whole 
context and you know whole video onto itself so i'm not going to talk about that today but just be aware you can the main thing you'll want to know is that they should be horizontal in nature and you want to maybe avoid ones that have a very distinct look or feel so for example i wouldn't do an urban hdri if i'm doing a sort of um nature shot or a, or a build that's out in nature so you context kind of matters with the hdris that's all i want to say on that for now i might do a, another video on that for later but for now i think we'll just go ahead and apply the sunset and i'm going to leave the settings on default for now but what i am going to do is click on the effects tab and turn off the auto exposure and you can see now things have gotten a lot lot darker and it's taking d5 a minute to just figure out the lighting so this is perfect because what it means is we can now start adding our own actual lights to this scene I'm going to go to my scenes and I'm going to hit the refresh icon, update scene. What I do want to make sure is that each of these scenes has the same lighting. So I'm going to go ahead and just hit refresh here. I'm going to do the same on all of the other scenes as well. Just making sure that they are all set to the sunset lighting. And if I click on scene four, yeah, that should have transferred over nicely. All right, back to scene one. By the way, you can also go up here to the options and make sure that we turn on camera switch only. This means that each individual scene here now, the only thing that will change is the camera. All of the other environment settings will carry through. Um, by default, that used to be on. It seems to be off now, which is kind of interesting. But um, it's just a little way, just something to be mindful of. You can have multiple scenes with different times of day, different lighting, diff basically a whole variety of changes or you can have it where the only thing that changes is the camera. And that's the one that I prefer working with. All right, so we're on the sunset. I am gonna drop the light on this down and I'm gonna rotate this just a little bit. I'm also gonna turn off all of any of these unnecessary layers. Again, it's all about just maximizing performance. I'm gonna make sure that the auto exposure is also off for all of these scenes and it showed again, there we go. All right, I want that off because I want the only light in the scene to be coming from my HDRI and the lights that I add myself. Let's go outside and just take a look at the sky. It's actually coming, it seems to be, just behind the buildings. I just want it to be ambient. There we go. All right. And I am going to increase the brightness a little bit. You can see I don't have any real direct light coming in. That should be okay. I go ahead and just uh, add a little dash. If I can get a little bit of light coming in, that will help light up the scene in a more natural fashion. You can also turn on the sun here. And I am going to crank this first just so we can see the effect that it's actually having. And I've got follow HDRI on. So as I spin the HDRI, the sun will move with it. Now, I just want a little bit of light coming in here. Just a little dash. And if it falls on that wall, great. There we go. I think that looks lovely. All right. Yeah, I'm going to put the sunlight intensity back to about 10, and the radius is fine. Again, it's quite dark, but I don't want a huge amount of light coming in from the outside because we are going to light the scene using a mixture of really just artificial lights and just get a little dash of that ambient light coming in. But that's all, just a little bit. All right, in the next bit, I'm going to add some lights to the scene. So you can see, uh, I've gone ahead and just tweaked the lighting a little bit. One issue that I noticed was going on was that light was not properly coming through this material here. I'm not sure what material D5 had assigned to it, so I manually went ahead and placed the glass material. So this is more akin to what I was looking for. So, you know, live and learn. Now, this is getting some nice lighting coming in. I, I love that it's coming through the uh, window panes and it's casting a nice bright light here. This is really, really nice. You know, it, you could theoretically go in here and adjust the auto exposure if you wanted and light your scene using just that light that's coming in. 
Um, I don't know if it's probably the best way to do it, but it is kind of cool to think that you could light your scene. Now, doing it like this, where you're lighting your scene exclusively from light coming in from the outside, is very much a sort of Lumion or kind of twin motion technique. But I'm going to go ahead and just put this back. I do want to go ahead and mess with the lights. All right. So we're on the default layer. We've got nothing else turned on. Let's look up here first. And these lights are the ones I want to use initially. And they were set to glass, but I have gone ahead and changed them to just a default material. And you can see there's nothing else going on here. Under the uh, map settings, we have the emissive tab. I'm going to click that, turn that on. Again, you'll notice nothing has changed right now. I do need to turn up the intensity. So I'm going to put this to five and hit enter. And yeah, let's see how that's lighting up the scene. Not too bad. So when you when it comes to using these emissive materials, you have two options for lighting. You can use emissive color. So you could place this to red. Now the temperature slider will give you a nice warm color. And I'm going to use that. Let's move this uh, shot, move the slider on the left or to the right, which will kind of change the warmth. Technically, it's changing the Kelvin, I believe, but I'm going to put it about here. And I do want cast shadow on. I do want these lights to actually cast a shadow in my scene. Now, that looks pretty mild. Not too bad. I think we could probably take the intensity up to maybe 10. Yeah, okay. And I'm going to select these up here as well and turn on the emissive tab. I'm going to put the, pretty much the same settings, an emissive of 10 and a temperature. I make these not as, um, not as cream maybe, but overall, how's that looking? Not too shabby at all. I think that looks pretty good. Let's go on to the next section. On the exposure again just back to the auto this is just because we're working on an interior and i don't want to have to deal with the camera effectively just trying to figure out every shot but one thing that is going to slow things down is the models that i brought in now i've turned off the decoration layer but another way we can adjust this is to select those objects these are the ones now that are not on the decoration layer and i'm going to actually maybe put these into a group so i'm holding and I'm selecting pretty much all of these objects. So let's do that. Let's go ahead and, yep, shift. I'm sorry, control. I should hold down control. And I'm gonna select pretty much all of the objects that I brought in. Effectively, everything decorative that, you know, really I can probably just hide as I work. Another option you could do would be to just go here to the bottom left and you can see all the objects that are on the default layer that are not a part of the original model and they're not grayed out. So they're not already hidden. I'm going to select all of those. And what I'm actually going to do is hit this little icon here to hide them. You can also go ahead and I'm going to group this. There we go. And now I can group it as it or hide it as a group. And that should help with the performance. That's given him back another maybe 10 frames per second, which makes for a much smoother navigation experience. One thing that is going to add to the slowdown here, I think as well, is also using the emissive lights, having them actually turned on. So a strip light is going to be effectively what it sounds like. So you could go ahead and place it. It, pl it comes in in strip format and you can in fact adjust the intensity. Let's use that maybe instead of the emissive and we'll see how that works. So to do that, I'm going to select the roof material, apply it to that green section. You can still see because I, that black line tells you D5 understands these are two separate materials. We can always come back and change that if we want to. But let's grab the strip light here. I'm going to place it. I don't necessarily place it like right into the wall, just a little bit off. And I'm being a little bit pedantic here now, just trying to position this correctly. There we go. And what I'm going to do is drop the intensity down to about five. And 
I think we just need to scale it. So I'm gonna hit V on the keyboard and I'm gonna just drag on that green axis right there. Or we can alternatively go in over here and just manually grab things on the Y. But either one will work just fine. And what I'm watching is just the corners, maybe just a little bit more. So I've placed my three strip lights and I've got one running on the left and right and the original one above the kitchen. And I've converted the strip that I had in the ceiling back to an emissive light. You'll notice I've turned everything off as well. The geo on the sky is set to pretty much nighttime now, so it's 12 o'clock in the morning. So pitch black outside, no light in the scene except what's coming from the emissive and these strip lights. And all of the strip lights have been set to pretty much the same intensity. You could, I mean, you could crank these if you really wanted. I, I'm just going to use them more decoratively. They're not going to be the main light source in the shot at all. I am going to move on. Wireframe is going to be very useful when it comes to positioning your lights. We can go to camera and top and you'll see we're looking straight down on our actual shot. And this will make positioning those lights very, very easy. You don't have to worry about spinning the camera. And if you're comfortable working in wireframes, you can kind of see where everything is at. So I placed one of these lights. I'm going to hold down shift, drag out another duplicate and select the original. So now I've got two selected. And again, hold down shift and drag this over to here and then select all four and drag out a duplicate as well. All right. So now you can see we've one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight spotlights in the scene. And I think that should be enough to get our scene lit up quite nicely. Go back to display or let's go to camera first and hit P on the keyboard or just go perspective. And let's put our display back to the lit mode. Hit scene one just to bounce back. OK, brilliant. You can see all our lights are working. I'm going to select all of them and adjust all of them at the same time. They're quite bright. I think the intensity is pretty strong. But if we look over here on the right, just like with the other lights, we have options. So IES light profile. Uh, I'm going to leave this at just the default. You can customize your IES. You can load up IES light profiles. I'm just going to leave it in default. I'm going to drop the intensity, though. Let's put this down. I want this to be a lot lower. Let's put it down to about 90. And I am going to adjust the attenuation radius is going to be the fall off. I want to see, and I'm going to do this very slowly. I just want to see really the, the sweet spot where the lights are coming down and they're hitting the floor and casting some nice shadows. And I'd love to say that there is, again, you know, this magical ideal setting that will do all of this for you. But really, you know, a lot of it is it's just manual work. There's no fast way around it. Okay, again, there's no other light in the scene, just the actual strip lights. And I'm going to actually turn off those two. They're at 50, put them to zero right now. Now, the only light in the scene is the spotlights. You see, by adjusting the cone angle, you can kind of get a very pronounced effect going on. I really wanted something a little bit softer. So I'm going to put this about, yeah, third, let's do 35. And again, I'm going to start taking up the intensity. I don't want it to be like, you know, we're, we don't want to be insanely overpowerful or anything like that. But let's do 150. That should be half of what the default is. I think you're getting a nice effect. We are getting shadows here, which is really what you want. And if we go back to our strip lights and turn those back on to 50. All right. All in all, this is looking quite nice. Now, bearing in mind, the auto exposure, I have have this off. So this is just lighting the scene as it is. One last light type we can add is the rectangular light. Uh, you'll notice I'm not using point lights. Uh, these are effectively omni lights. Um, I haven't really found much use for them, to be honest. Rectangular light. I'm going to select this, and I'm going to place it right up here. And 
I'm going to change the color to a very vivid red so you can see really the effect that it's actually having. And I'm going to crank the intensity quite a bit. That's obviously horrible, but I'm going to make sure I can lift this up. And I, I want to have it coming just th um, sort of right on the ceiling. That's why we changed the color to red so we can actually just see it in real time. There it is. I want it to be about here. Okay, lovely. And I'm going to adjust the size. So let's put this to about 8,000. And I'll see how big that is. I could probably use maybe two of these. So maybe let's do 4,000. This is just going to add a lot of flat white light into the shot. It's going to be at a very, very low intensity. And I think, can we take this down? I think that's lovely. About, let's do 3,800. And I am going to duplicate this. I'm outside the building right now. And if I just hold down, let me, ooh. All right, there's my duplicate. Go back to scene one. Very, very bright. Doesn't matter. What we'll actually do is select both of these change the temperature color to just pure white and drop the intensity quite low. You can still see it's blowing out the scene a little bit. Let's put this down to one. All right. And with everything else on, I'm pretty happy with the result of this. I don't have the emissive lights working yet. But I can just toggle those back on. But all in all, I'm getting a nice blend of lights and darks. You know, there, there are things that we could tweak here, but uh, I think we're in a pretty good spot. All right, let's now is actually a good time to do a control S and save. Let's go back to our environment, go back to the HDRI that we had set up. I think that's probably a little too bright now, so I think we can dial the brightness of that down, and we can probably take the sunlight intensity down. We've got a nice look going on with our lights. Select the emissive materials, turn those back on. I'm going to do this for all the emissive materials in the scene, and that should include the kitchen lights as well. Select those. They should all be on. These ones are, I think, on. They're not as visible, but overall, I think our scene is looking pretty nice. I think I will also increase the intensity of the emissives. Let's double that a little bit, and we'll do the same up here too. The ceiling lights, I may convert to just a generic like white color. They won't be massively visible in any of these shots, so I don't have to worry as much about them. The ones I'm really interested in are the, these emissives right here. I take down the exposure value just a little bit, just until I get to the, the look that I really want. So it's about there. Now I can go in and make changes to any of this as well. If I decide that, for example, I want these to be these materials to be stronger, you can always just go back and tweak. The joy of working in D5 is really the responsiveness. Now I need to change these blue, uh, green lights up here, and you can see there's nothing special about these. They're they really are just circles. And I'm going to turn the emissive on, and I'm going to put these ones very low. I don't need these to be kind of crazy powerful. They're just there really just to look like the spotlight is actually blasting light out. So I did lose, yeah, there we go. I'm just gonna reestablish my scenes here. I did lose them just in my haste to adjust the environment a little bit. And let's grab this guy right here. We'll do it from this angle here. Again, the these shots haven't really set up the camera per se. So all of that, the focal length and all that tweaking is going to have to be done a little bit later. And I think that'll work for scene four. All right. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. 
one thing to note on the curtain material, something I forgot to mention, is that there is a curtain material. You can search for the materials library and apply it. It comes with opacity and this nice neutral gray opacity map. So you can adjust the fall off or how see-through that map actually is. Okay, let's just do a quick last minute check here. Now is probably a good time if you're working away to actually take a break, give yourself a breather, give yourself a mental breather, which is what I'm probably going to do. And we can always come back and readjust. We're getting some interesting material stuff going on. I think that is a, a, a one of these newer known issues. So what we'll do is... Let's go ahead and we'll put a pin in it and pick it back up in a moment. This is also probably a good time to save and turn off D5 and then turn it back on. I've noticed you do get a bit of a performance improvement when you do that. All right, let's take a break, come back and reassess our image. Welcome back everybody to the second part. So we've gone ahead and made a few changes and hopefully you were all able to take a little bit of a break, get outside, you know, give your eyes a break too is the other thing. Um, one suggestion I will have is when you start hitting a wall and you will if you've been doing this for any length of time is to just take a break. It's just the best thing you can do. And so I made some changes in the interim. Went outside and darkened the environment quite a lot. We're trying to elicit a sort of sunset, dusk time of day. And I think by dropping the HDR quite low, we kept the sunlight and we tweaked the, really the radius of the sun, but by and large, we've just left everything as is there. Just tweaking the light value a little bit, but still keeping the same HDRI. I've gone ahead and changed out the wall material here. The image was starting to look very gray on gray on gray, and that's kind of okay-ish up to a point, but it was getting to be visually unappealing. Now, part of that, I think, is the bed model itself, which, again, this was intended as a Lumion render, so the bed model would be good by Lumion standards, but, you know, still not really necessarily up to the standard you'd want right now. So I've gone ahead and changed out the concrete to a more textured but not as overly gray concrete. And I've removed the artwork and replaced it with a photographic piece from uh, Simon Brosniak. You can get his stuff on the warehouse and he has a whole series on dancers and ballerinas and it's just really really great photography just really really cool artwork as well all right made a few tweaks to the lights but nothing much and uh, i've gone ahead and just put them into groups so you can see we've got groups with different lights in them so the main thing was to increase and stretch the rectangle lights that adds a lot more just sort of ambient light into the scene and i have two of those set to 10 and those are just rectangle lights just hanging out in the ceiling I've gone ahead and added a few little strip lights here, just in the kitchen, just so that these can cast a tiny little dash of light onto whatever objects we have in the kitchen, sort of like, you know, under cabinet or above cabinet lighting, if you will. And they're set to relatively low strength. They're not crazy strong or anything. I just want them to add a little bit of light. I'm going to turn on our strip lights. I did go ahead and increase the intensity of the strip lights up here, put them up to a hundred. And if we turn back on the other groups as well, you can see, um, let me see, that's just stuff. Let's go ahead and click up here and go to light. You, if you're struggling with your scene, you can always use this drop down menu here to pick specific parts of your scene. I'm going to go ahead and put it back to light and then I'm going to turn on group two, which is going to be our spotlights themselves. Now, I did actually increase the intensity of these. I found they just weren't really doing what I wanted them to do. I wanted more interesting shadows coming from them. And I just found that they weren't really hitting the way they were intended. I still think the overall lighting in the scene is not too bad. I'd prefer a little bit of a more dramatic lighting setup, but I think when you're doing this evening time, you're not getting enough sun coming in. So what we may end up doing is maybe putting a rectangular light outside the windows just to add a little bit more shadow. 
But all in all, I think the lighting setup is not too shabby. I think I've added just one more light in here as well, which was just intended really just to add a little bit of light coming in from another room. And so that's going to be a very basic rectangle light. And what we can also do is if we want just a little bit more light, we could just use a single point light and place that here. Just lift it up. Probably won't be looking into this room, so we can probably get away with putting that there and just kind of having light falling out. All right, all in all, pretty happy. Let's go ahead and convert our emissive lights. We'll turn these fellows back on. And again, just there it is, toggle that and put it to about 20. I'm gonna change the color to make these just, just make them white or just a little warm might be better. Just a little bit warm. There we go. Just a little bit of warmth to the scene. And these ones up here, I'm going to again turn them back on. They weren't really as strong as I wanted them to be, so I am going to crank these ones just a bit more. And I'm going to leave them just a generic kind of white color. Okay. All in all, much happier with the look and feel of the scene, especially if we turn our decoration back on. You know, I, I think I could probably add a light or something here over here on this section. Um, but all in all, not too bad, especially if we bounce through the actual scene setups. I think we could do it a little bit more light from the outside maybe coming in, but that's just fine tuning it. What we'll do now is do a test render really quickly and see how that looks and make some sort of suggested changes based on that. All right, I'll see you when the test render is done. What I tell my students is sort of when it's done, it's it's really done. And that would be my advice here as well. So we're going to go up here to the image mode on the top right. And you'll see if you've used E5 before, this is mostly familiar. What is new is the presence of the focal length slider. So if you prefer to set up your shots not using the field of view, but using the focal length, this will be really handy for you. Now, if you're coming from other software that uses focal length like Lumion does, you may find it easy just to type in a value you're familiar with, 30, hit enter, and just look at your scene. This means you don't have to worry too much about the FOV, the field of view, and trying to line this up perfectly. The two are effectively sort of connected. So I'm going to try 35. And I think that's probably a little too tight. If we bring the camera back, we start, yeah, we start getting into the wall, which we can still work around, but maybe let's just do a field of view of 30. I think that will work just fine. And we are going to go up to camera and hit F8 to get our two point perspective. That's perfect. And I think I'm going to go ahead now and just start rendering these out. So, what I'm going to do is render at about 6K per image. Now, you'll notice when we do that, we get these black lines on the horizon. You can see it very prominently on the top up here. This is showing you what's actually going to be in your shot. And so you have to be mindful of that. Okay, everybody. So here we are with our final render. And so this is... Probably my favorite render of the ones that we produced and, you know, still probably my favorite angle. You'll notice one or two differences. I did change the outside sky that we were using. I had completed pretty much all of the renders, took a look at them and realized that no matter what, the skyline that we had brought in from SketchUp just really wasn't good enough. It, it just looked bad. And um, sort of something I wish I had, you know, figured out before I'd gone ahead and done all the renders. But, you know, better that you, viewer, maybe learn that now. And you'll see, I've actually replaced this with the skyline from some of the newer skylines that you get in D5 version 2.4. Now, these come as part of, I think, the Pro subscription, and they make for pretty nice environments. And you can just plop these into your scene and they'll do a really good job hiding sort of the dreaded horizon line. I also changed the sky a little bit in terms of the rotation and kept the values the same, but added more of this yellow light as opposed to some of the purple light that was coming in. Okay, with that being said, let's go ahead and start our production, or should I say our post-production on this image.
So the first thing we're going to do is right click, duplicate the background layer. Go ahead and rename this BKG, which is just the way I learned to do this background. I'm going to drag the AO layer to the top of the stack. Drag that up. Change the blend mode here. Yeah, I think, I think we're going to do soft light. Put it down around 50. Right click, duplicate it one more time. Click OK. And then change the blend mode to, I think, darken will be, should work. Let's see. Yeah, maybe not. Okay, let's just change it to the old favorite overlay and drop the opacity a little bit lower. Go ahead and grab the reflection layer, bring that to the top of the stack, change the blend mode to really any of these additive modes, so light and screen or color dodge. I think linear dodge might actually work pretty nicely. Let me toggle that on and off. Yeah, I think linear dodge is perfect. Drop the strength of this a little dash. Okay. I can ignore the rest of these layers. And I'm going to move the original one up to the top. So the, the default background layer, the duplicate here, is going to stay there. Select all of these. Right click. Merge layers. And that looks pretty good. Let's go ahead and add a levels adjustment really quickly. Just ask Photoshop to look at the image and figure out the values. Click this little icon here, the little histogram, and click Auto. This will ask Photoshop to effectively analyze the image. The way I understand it is my monitor may not be your monitor, and so I can't really go off how the values look to me, but I can always just ask Photoshop to go in and do this. All right, I'm gonna drop the strength of that just a little bit. Right click, merge it down. Looks good so far. Right, let's go into Camera Raw. So we're gonna bounce up to our old friend Camera Raw. Grab the Camera Raw filter. And that will apply to this level, but not the background. So we'll always keep our original background BKG right there. Okay, now, we can also go ahead and hit the auto button and ask Camera Raw to figure out the lighting and values, but I prefer to go through these manually. Pretty okay with the exposure. If anything, I may take it down just a little bit. I tend to ignore the contrast slider. It's just, you know, there are better ways to do that to kind of darken the values and lighten some. So let's see the highlights. Maybe take that up. Darken the shadows here. So you're going to add a little dash of texture and a little dash of clarity. Now the dehaze slider, you can see the effect this has if you crank it to the right or crank to the left. Adding a little bit here on the negatives will give a slight hazy quality, which might work well for this image. Remember the vibrance. I usually add about 10 or 20% on the vibrance. And then I'll actually take down the saturation just a little bit. I think that works quite well. Okay. All right. Curves. The curves is something I've been messing around with lately, and I quite like the result that it gives. You can see we've got a very large kind of dark spike right here. And so I'm going to click here and maybe take this up a little bit, trying to raise up the darkest parts of the image and then bringing back down those midtones. Okay. So you can see the same effect. If we move this slider here, we are lightening those shadows. Remember, even a black interior, it's not like the walls are pitch black. Not really. Okay. I'm not liking the look of this. Lovely. All right. Let's move on a little bit. We can ignore the detailing. Let's get down into the color mixture. I want to bring back some of the yellows and some of the greens, some of the sort of the hues that we've stripped out a little bit. Let's go to the reds first. Now I'm just looking at the oranges right over here in particular. Let's see if we bring these back. Get some of that warmth back into the image. Gonna make the plants super green. You can see the effect that has if you look at the left where that plant is. And I wanna bring back some of the blues if I can from the chair in particular. The chair kind of got a little bit stripped out. OK, 
Okay, looks good so far. All right, so with that merged down, I am going to duplicate this one more time. I'm going to do one more pass in Camera Raw Filter. And for this, I may go to the Profiles. I'm going to go to Browse. And I'm going to click on the Modern tab. And you can see these are effectively presets that will take what the tweaks that we've already done and sort of work on them in an additive fashion. I'm looking for one that sort of gives me the result that I kind of like. And I think Modern 9 will work quite well. I'm going to drop that down just a little bit and hit back. You can see the histogram up here gives you a good idea of really where things are at in this image in terms of the overall look. You can also tweak your image by grabbing these sliders and manually adjusting them, which I think is really, really cool. I think that looks nice. And I'm going to duplicate this one more time. And I'll go to Filter. Back to Camera Raw. And this time I'm going to grab a preset. I'm going to find one that I've used before that I kind of like. And I've got some favorites here. So these are effectively sort of Lightroom presets. You can find a lot of these online. And if you spend a bit of time searching around, I actually picked these ones up from a person who sells them on Etsy. I'll try and put a link out to them. I think some of them are absolutely wonderful. They are very, very strong on their own. But I think, you know, if you blend these together, you can get a pretty nice result. So I think I'll grab one of these pumpkin ones. And again, you can see these were actually intended for autumnal or fall photography. And I like that pumpkin six, and I'm going to just drop that strength down just a little bit. All right, so now you can see we've got our original background. We've got the initial edits, the overall levels and things like that. Then we've got the modern effect. And on top of that, we've got basically, let's call it the sort of pumpkin spice effect. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to blend between these three and get a look that I like. So I'm not putting them all at full strength. So put this down to 50 and drop this one down as well a little bit. Okay. And when I'm pretty happy with that, the overall look and feel of these, I think what I'll do is select all these layers, right click, duplicate just those layers and merge these layers. Okay, all in all, pretty happy with that. Let's go ahead and start making some changes to particular areas. So I'm going to duplicate one more time. I know I do the duplication thing a lot. It's sort of just how I learned it. Let's go to the color selection. So this is going to be basically the material ID or the ID pass and select these lights here and select the yellow one. And we'll also select this one up here. All right, go back to this layer, do a control C and a control V. So we'll have pasted really a copy of these lights onto a new layer. It's a little hard to see there, but if we were to add a new layer directly underneath this, so drag that and this layer that's directly underneath Let's fill it with black. And that gives you an idea sort of of what we're actually working with. We've just pasted that content onto a new layer. I'm going to delete that. And I'm going to call this one lights. And with that done, we can go to the FX tab, add an outer glow. This is a very old school technique. You can see it's coming in pink, which is just the, the levels that was set to. I am going to adjust the spread and the size, take that out a little bit more. I am getting some weird sections down here, but we'll mask those out. And we can go up here to change the color. I think that color, yeah, I think that's not too bad. And I'm just going to adjust these parameters again. You wanna get a nice soft fall off. There we go, looks lovely. I think we can work with that, click OK. Now obviously it's working in areas that we hadn't intended it to, so add a mask down on your layers palette. Grab a, just a soft fluffy brush, scale that brush down, 
and paint out the areas that you don't want. Yeah, we can paint that back in. Yeah, a little highlight. And I think all in all, I don't see any other areas of concern. Okay. And we can always try and change the blend mode of this to lighten or screen. Just run through these blend modes, just see if we can get a better result. I don't really know until you try. Off, on, off, on. Yeah, I think that's subtle and uh, little glow is nice. Okay, that's in a pretty good spot. All right, we're almost at the very end now. So just looking at my image, there's a few more things that we should do. I'm going to select everything, all the ones that we've made changes to, merge them down. And I'm aware you could probably do groups and all sorts of fancy grouping and things like that, but sometimes it's just nice to kind of work with what you have. Duplicate that. I'm going to do one more filter, uh, camera raw filter. Then we'll do some more tweaks and then a lens correction, and then that will be it. So this is just the final pass that I'm going to do. And again, I'm gonna run this one just a little bit more manually, just tweaking kind of what I have, the changes we have, and I'll maybe darken the whites a little bit. And you, can, you could probably just spend a lot of time doing this, just really going in, just making changes, uh, you know, adjusting things as you see fit. I think that works okay. I'm going to drop the exposure just a tiny bit. Let's see here, I'm just tweaking the image a little bit as we go. I think that will look nice. All right. Now, I'm going to go and, I know, duplicate one more time. I'm aware, I know. But we'll duplicate it one more time. Um, we shall go to Filter, Other, High Pass. This is a, uh, again, another very old technique from anyone who ever did kind of, you know, game art or ZBrush back in the day. You're probably used to doing this if you did, like, caricature work or things like that. So um, radius of one should be fine. Change the blend mode to overlay, and that will give you some, let me zoom in here a little bit. That'll give you some, kind of some of this nice fidelity back again. Yeah, it's, over, it's just such a great technique. And we'll merge that down. I'm gonna duplicate this one more time, and I may go ahead and let's, I'm gonna look for, not my blur tool, but let's grab the burn tool. And I'm gonna scale this guy up quite a bit. This is on its own layer, so I'm gonna duplicate this again and just put this to burn and dodge. And we'll call this one burn, burn slash dodge. There we go. I'm just dab this ever so slightly around the corners and in the back. I'm just gonna bring the focus a little bit back to the areas you want the viewer looking at, which is really the central area. And so this is almost like a painted on vignette. I'm just slowly, that's the mid-tones. Let's take down the highlights a little bit. Just a little bit. And we're gonna darken the shadows ever so slightly. Like I said, almost a homemade vignette, if you will. And I think that's a little, yeah, a little strong there, so I'll bring that down there. And we'll switch back to the Dodge tool, and this time we'll do something very similar, about 50% on just the mid-tones, and make your brush quite large on this one. And we're just going to focus on lightening up certain areas. All right. And duplicate this fellow one more time. We could go in now and we can use this layer here. 
So this is the Z depth or Z buffering pass or Z pass, whatever terminology you want to use, the Z depth pass. And what we can do is use this as a mask for really blurred camera. So we'll duplicate this one more time. And by the way, you don't have to duplicate as often as I do. I, I'm doing it the way that I effectively learned it. That may not be the ideal way, and there's probably a much better way. There's a lot of way to do everything in Photoshop. It's just doing it the way that I learned. And we're going to go Filter, Blur. Now, you can use Lens Blur, which is, I think, many is the correct way to do this. I'm going to do it the kind of cheaper way, which is Gaussian Blur. 34, that's fine. Just click OK. Add a mask. Now select the Z pass, control A, control C to copy, and alt click on the mask here, and control V and paste it in. Now we can turn off the original image, which is the grayscale, and you can see how this pass is actually working a little bit. It's using the black and white color values here to ask to act as a basically just a mask. Now, is it ideal? I don't know. I, I think it's, you know, we can go in here and we can do control I to invert it. And let's see how this is working. And so that's kind of blurring. We're getting kind of the opposite effect. The background is really clear. So I think if we undo that, this is right. It's just really strong. And so let's bring this way, way, way down. Is this any better than painting it by hand? I don't really know. I don't know if it's any faster. I still think going forward, I'm probably just gonna paint the blur in, but that little low percentage might be okay. It kind of adds a little bit, of, a little bit of interest to the image where everything is not completely in focus, but again, very low levels. All right, merge down and filter, lens correction, custom, and uh, negative one, and just add a little bit of this cyan or red fringe. And you'll really see that just in area, in certain areas, you can see it right on the light in the center. I think it looks okay. You're adding back in a tiny bit of imperfections. Again, we'll go to filter noise and add um, just a small amount of noise, about 1% will work. And I think we're in a pretty good spot. I think now is a good time to go ahead and save this. So let's do that. Lastly, if you made it to the end of this video, thank you so much for watching. I hope that you found something useful in this video. And if you did, please think about subscribing as we should have some more content coming out soon. And we'll also take a look at some of the other newer features of D5. Thank you so much and I'll see you in the next video.